So welcome everybody to our second lecture of the day of day one of Roscon 2021 Cloud Edition. This time we are having as a subject the end of, the, of this arms race, web developers versus uh, the advertising uh, companies. And we have a lecture about a new method, about a new proposition, how to do a, do a uh, data privacy privacy friendly uh, technique of uh, web analytics. And for this, I present you Hendrik Niefeld and Frederick Ring, who will present their lecture now. If you have any questions, please come into the uh, big blue button uh, chat room and uh, have your questions there. I will present them at the end of the of the lecture, and then uh, both of the speakers can can answer the questions there. So have fun. Okay, uh, thanks uh, everybody and uh, good morning. Uh, thanks uh, for being here with us today. Uh, my name is Hendrik. And before we begin, I would like to thank the FrostCon team for having us. Uh, we are very happy to be able to share our thoughts on privacy with you guys today. And before we begin, I would like to share a beautiful dream with you. Uh, please take a moment and let this sink in. Uh, imagine the internet was a place where you could trust operators of, of web services again. Yeah, before we take a closer look at this vision, uh, Frederick uh, will tell you a little bit more about our backgrounds. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, good morning. So, um, who we are and what we do are some words about our background. We're Hendrik and Frederick. We're working together on a project that's called Often since early 2019. Um, Often is a web analytics software. We started this out as a software as a service kind of thing, which was very on vogue back then, but um, turned out our ideas did not really match this um, method of operation too much. So um, we turned this into a self-hosted open source software. And um, we also found that many of the ideas that we have in this software are uh, very uh, are a very good fit for making them available to other softwares as well. So apart from building that web analytics software called Often, we also branch out and um, offer tools for other softwares to handle data in a fair manner. Um, we are currently funded by NLNet and the NGI Zero initiative, which is great for us because it allows us to operate on like without any business needs, but we can just build the software in a way where we say, hey, this is great from a privacy perspective. Um, yeah, and our two main products are often, which is a fair alternative to common web analytics tools. And then we are also working on a proposed standard that's called analytics.txt. And analytics.txt lets you, as a website operator, disclose the way in which you handle user usage data transparently. Yeah, and we will talk about those two things later on in more in detail. OK, so let's start with uh, our talk. So um, a very fundamental. Uh, idea behind everything that we're building is, on the one hand, users have a right to privacy over their data, and on the other hand, they'll have a leg limited interest in usage data of their services. And um, this means whatever we build, we always look at both users and operators. So because like many of the tools, like ad blockers, for example, they just look at one part of the equation, and we try to always look at both parts of the equation. Um, because we believe that you can run your website or application in a fair and transparent manner and still make it a business. So fairness and transparent handling of data is not something that is limited to hobby projects for us, but it's something that applies to everything. 
and it won't hurt you if you run a business but still want to like handle data fairly. So, and I think here is a point where uh, we should put a little disclaimer in because we are not lawyers, uh, obviously, uh, ourselves. Uh, uh, the stuff we are presenting you here is uh, based on uh, different sources, on conversations we had uh, and obs uh, observations we made during the last years working on these two projects. But uh, it seems to us uh, let us let us also see the internet as a place uh, where could also be money be made, and there are a few uh, guidelines uh, that GDPR uh, uh, presents, and I will shortly introduce them. Uh, there are a lot of aspects to share, but I've picked only uh, three ones because they are will they, they will be uh, relevant for our talk later. First of all, the things should be necessary to process. Uh, personal data shall be adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purpose for which they are processed. Next point is the legitimate interest. Uh, processing shall be lawful only if the following applies processing is necessary for the purpose of the legitimate interests the controller or by a third party and these are two aspects combined uh, both are about consent or freely given consent uh, processing shall be lawful only if the data subject has given consent to the processing of his or her personal data and consent must be freely given specific informed and unambiguous the element free implies a real choice by the data subject okay the, that's what you can find in the law but, but, yeah, but uh, how does this look like in practice? Because you might have noticed all of those laws might make sense from a uh, law perspective, but it's where uh, implementing them in the real world is a totally different thing. Um, so what data is necessary to process? What's legitimate interest and in when is consent freely given? Um, those are very tough questions to answer and um, most of us as web developers probably aren't very good in law and everything and uh, but we're very good at tech so what we do is we read those laws and we don't really understand them and then we look for technical loopholes so that we can like so that we don't have to actually deal with those laws. And this is a very um, dense, uh, mechan very dangerous reflex that all of us are having, but it's totally normal. And it's also kind of important to stress that this does not only apply to uh, a solo web developer who is working on a small website, but this also applies to large scale when you're an enterprise and you're very good at tech, I mean, even if you have a legal department, you will still try to find uh, you will still try to find a technological solution to the problem at hand. And the top technological solutions at hand are mostly loopholes. Um, yeah, let's let's have a look at those questions in uh, specifics. So, when is data actually necessary? When is it actually necessary to process data? Um, the thing is, even the law states, it's not really clear. So um, it says it has it necessary does not necessarily mean that it's absolutely essential, but also on the other hand, it must be more than just standard practice. And in this gray area, it's very hard to find find your position on 
what you are going to do. For example, one one example that probably everyone knows is um, the handling of log data. I mean, for example, it, you have a web server, it logs IP addresses by default, and it logs them forever. Um, do you actually need to do it? Is, is it necessary for you to, I mean, does the default of this behavior imply that it's necessary for you to process the data? And um, the answer is, it's probably very hard to tell. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the uh, same probably goes for the question of legitimate interest. Um, for example, this is something where the topic of like marketing purposes come into play. Is uh, tracking users for marketing purposes, is this legitimate interest or not? And even the, the, the GDPR law has a passage that says, direct marketing purposes may be regarded as carried out for legitimate interest. So, um, the answer is, I did it, and um, <laughs> it's just like it's impossible to tell. Um, legitimate interest is also the ultimate loophole for everything, ranging from analytics to error reporting to screen reporting to um, saying, for example, there's there's this passage that says, okay, uh, when your web when your web service is at risk. Um, and you protect your web service from a risk, then this is legitimate interest. So what's a risk? I mean, is, the, is it a risk that your web service will be visited by a bot at some point, which means you have to collect everything by default without consent? Or is it not a risk? And um, so this is another thing that's very, very hard to tell. And it also creates like very odd situations because if you say you do something out of legitimate interest regarding data collection, then this raises the standard for data subject rights. For example, if you say I have a legitimate interest in collecting data for the purpose of marketing, then you also have to grant the data subject the right of deletion, which means in the end you will have to collect even more data because you do it out of legitimate interest. If you wouldn't have to implement the data subject rights for something, you probably could collect the small subset of data only. But because you have to fulfill the data subject rights, it means you have to collect even more data out of legitimate interest. So, um, yeah, very hard for us to come up with something where we say this is this is a lawful solution because no one, even the law says it doesn't know what a lawful solution is. And um, maybe we can also have a look at the last of those three questions, which is also kind of important for us in the software we're building, which is freely given consent. Um, I mean, people nowadays love to hate cookie banners, so-called cookie banners. It's also strange that it's called a cookie banner and not a consent banner, but that's a different topic. And um, so when, I mean, you probably all know those monstrosities and all of the dark patterns that apply. And you probably also, if you ask yourself at what point was this consent actually freely given? Then the answer probably is you don't know. Um, there are patterns like people have you, you could pay for a tracking free version of a newspaper or you just accept the tracking. Is this freely given consent? It's probably not. People still, people still get away with it. Um, it's just very hard to tell. And um, in this consent, there's also this topic of bundled consent, which is in theory, you would have, you uh, opt into one thing, and then all of a sudden this is in, implies consent for a bunch of other things. And this is also not legal, but this also 
incentivizes mechanisms like, for example, um, Google is phasing out like third party cookies and trying to replace them with something that's called federated learning of cohorts. And um, this basically just circumvents bundle consent because you have to consent, your consent is only like you consent into the very same thing always and it's just used by multiple parties. Um, yeah. So this, as you might see, <laughs> its answers to those three questions are all of the three questions are less important to answer, and um, still people need to comply with those laws. And what do people do? People come up with uh, creative workarounds, and they start an arms race. Yes, uh, this is uh, our uh, observation that in recent years a technolo te technological and legal arms race has emerged and uh, I want to uh, tell a little bit uh, more about why do we believe that. Uh, the first hand you have uh, the ambiguous legal situations, which means uh, legislators take a long time to implement the law like GP, uh, GDPR. And then, on the other hand, local authorities uh, don't enforce it uh, stringently. I mean, Germany is a very good example where different laws overlap, and these laws are from different eras back in time. So you always have a clear, unclear, uh, vague situation. What is the actual law in Germany at the moment? Uh, another point is, uh, of course, law needs to be interpreted. Uh, and with this fact, the, of course, uh, content maybe can always be bypassed uh, through uh, just a creative interpre uh, interpretation of law. Uh, then you just stuff the, your creative methods uh, in the small print and try to uh, try to get through with it, uh, which somehow feels like the norm nowadays from, from our observation. It's more like uh, who dares wins. Uh, it's just about uh, not getting caught. Another point is... Uh, that you could try to uh, game consent. Uh, uh, I'm sure the audience is aware of uh, all the different psychological methods that are out there. It's known as dark patterns to trick you into giving consent or uh, trying to uh, make it so... <laughs> painful for you that you uh, give your consent away because you just want to get through with it. Uh, and let's not forget uh, our big uh, tech titans in the game. Yeah, so this is coming to the topic that I touched about the moving, Google moving from interest, uh, from third party cookies to interest cohorts, um, we're in a situation where regulation will always fail at the technical level because implementing a new technology is done much quicker than passing laws. So for example, yeah, we have this thing, it's explicitly called cookie law, but what happens if Google, who basically has a monopoly on browsers, says, um, we are, we'll just stop using cookies and we will start using a tracking technology that simply isn't covered by law yet. And this is a uh, unfortunate situation because, like as I already mentioned, implementing a new technology is probably much quicker than passing the law. And it's um, Google basically, Google controls the Chrome browser and uh, Firefox is also dependent on Google. 
So basically, technical standards nowadays, they require the biggest advertising company to implement them and to vouch for them. And basically, no one else has a say right now, um, which even if you're a small scale business, you are still subject to the fight between that big advertising company and the law because they basically build the internet right today. Um, yeah, also this entire situation creates a really strange set of audits. If you look at it, I mean, first of all, we have those consent banners um, that are supposed to be like user friendly, but in the end, like the people who have to implement the consent banners build them in such a way that they make you hate the consent banner and they basically trick you into thinking, hey, the consent banner is something that's there to, uh, when instead it's in theory, it's supposed to help you, but they turn it into something that actually hurts you. Um, then, as the slide says, this is also a really strange trend in privacy-friendly software. We've seen there's a lot of privacy-friendly software out there, and um, then you come up with the question, hey, how do I exclude myself from statistics in your privacy-friendly software? And the answer by vendors usually is, hey, install an app blocker and block yourself, block our software, our privacy software which, to be honest, is kind of odd to us. Or, for example, a technical detail that's also very odd. For example, if you're on the server, you can store IP addresses, user agents, without any consent, which makes users perfectly identifiable. But as soon as you start doing it on the client by assigning a random identifier, you all of a sudden need a consent because you're storing a cookie. Um, so yeah, a lot of things don't really make sense in this entire situation. It, this just leads to like users being annoyed and operators of websites being like super confused. Uh, the entire situation does not really paint a pretty picture because users' trust has been sustainably damaged. I mean, for example, you will run into situations where you are being asked for consent and then you notice they don't even care. They will just track you no matter what. Also, there are user-friendly regulations out there and then they're being turned into an annoyance and they basically are used as an argument against handling data properly. Operators, basically, even especially when you're on a smaller scale, they suffer from the ambiguous legal situation and just try to stay under the radar so that no one actually looks at their implementation. Because, as we've seen, you really don't know how to implement stuff. And um, the only, <laughs> this is probably a very German thing, but uh, Basically, the only one who loves the situation is like the warning letter industry where you can send out warning letters to people who obviously do stuff wrong. And, but, I mean, if we look at the idea behind data privacy laws, then this should be something that helps both users and operators alike. Yeah. Yes, and... I think here's a good point to uh, say a bit more about our personal uh, motivations on this topic. Uh, we think it's time to end this arms race because we believe, or our initial uh, feeling was, we don't, we just don't want to go along uh, with this anymore. But uh, on the other hand, we are also sure that we have to start small. Uh, and then it can, be, uh, can become a big thing, and then it can become a trend. Because we don't believe uh, you start things, changes like this, uh, like a revolution. Uh, but you uh, rather should start a trend, which then can evolve in something better. Uh, 
And we also uh, always want to make sure, let's think outside our own bubble. Uh, ordinary users uh, deserve, deserve to be respected as well, even if they are not so much interested in the topic. And uh, if this is a point you want to follow, then you also know you have to take operators on board as well. Uh, and for this process to get started, we formulated a few basic ideas, guidelines, simple instructions, uh, as you like, that uh, I want to get through with you quickly. First important point, try to avoid data collection because oftentimes data is collected because it's just technically possible. And if you look close at it, there's no real benefit derived from it. Next important thing, be transparent. Uh, provide the user information about uh, your approach to data collection. We are working on uh, certain technically, uh, technical solutions for this. More about this later. Uh, and uh, accept user's choice. Uh, it sounds maybe easy uh, and simple, but uh, think about it. You have to accept a no the same way you accept a yes, talking about uh, consent banners. Uh, and by the way, we still believe the consent banner is the best solution at the moment for this. So uh, also, there is this aspect that we we are the opinion uh, that the data you collect after opt-in is from much higher quality. Uh, next point on the list, uh, minimize your data footprint uh, because um, after opt-in, in most uh, cases, uh, data sets are already good enough to uh, allow a comprehensive analysis. And last but not least, uh, least uh, use better tools because tools you use are often prescribe a certain way of dealing with data that you then uh, simply go along with. Oh, talking about tools. Sorry, I still needed to unmute myself. Um, so, talking about tools, how do we implement all of this that we've just been talking about in our own pool? And uh, we started, we well, started already talking analytics.txt. So, let's have a look at Often maybe. And Often is a self hosted web analytics software that you can install on your own servers. And uh, the basic principles behind it, and the fundamental principles behind often are data is collected after opt-in only. So you will never be uh, tracked when you don't consent into it. You can you revoke your consent at any time as a user. You can inspect your own data at any time as a user. You can delete your own data at any time. Um, so this is for you as a user, it's perfectly transparent. You will see the very same interface as the operator does. Um, for the operator, it's um, a very lightweight solution that focuses on like the very, uh, on the most important data only. For example, we don't collect Geolocation or things like this, we never look at IP addresses. So everything is built with the concept of Datensparsamkeit in mind. And uh, we also found that this actually, even if it sounds like very uh, limiting, we found that it's actually a very good way of getting high quality data because you automatically get rid of all of the bots and all of that. So um, if you're interested, give it a try. It's You can run a demo on your own system in no time. You can install it. It's a single binary. So if you're interested, give it a try. It's www.often.dev. Uh, 
or github.com slash often. Yeah, and the second project we are working on is this standard called analytics.txt and analytics.txt gives you, as the operator of a website, it gives you the possibility to disclose what you're actually doing. So for example, because there's like the the things that you can actually observe happening in the browser are limited and um, <clears throat> it might be interesting for users and operators alike to actually know what's going on behind the scenes. How long is data being retained? Who do I, who do you share data with? Do you share data with third parties or with the public or stuff like this? So analytics.txt is a format that lets you specify this behavior of your website and disclose it to users. And users could then, for example, use a browser extension to find out about what this website actually does and how it handles your data. Um, you can have a look at analyticstext.org. It has a wizard for you to create such a file and instructions where you can put it. Um, this draft is, it's still a draft. So if you have feedback on this, we're also very open to find out about your opinions on this. Just open an issue on the GitHub repository or send me an email. I will discuss things about this. Yeah, uh, I think in summary, uh, you could say we are primarily committed to fairness and trust on the web because we are absolutely confident that a fair balance between operators and users' interests makes the web a better place. Uh, and maybe as a last thought here, uh, especially operators with uh, ethical business models will benefit from this attitude because who has already fairness and trust uh, on his agenda uh, for for those people, of course, uh, this approach is, uh, approach is very helpful. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for your time and your interest. Uh, that's uh, all from us now. And yeah, we look forward from your for your questions. Thank you, Hendrik, and thank you, Frederick, for your lecture. Um, I was quite interested uh, in the lecture itself since I know a little bit about GDPR. And also I am in a company which is using right now Google Analytics as an analytics tool and I may be able to persuade them to switch to often or something similar. Um, um, to all the, to all the uh, attendees on the stream also, please join us in the big blue button room if you want to ask any questions. Uh, the chat is open for everybody, and if, if there are questions, I will read them to, to the stream so Hendrik and Frederick can answer them, and uh, the questions are already then in the stream itself. Um, I have at least one question. How do you make sure that someone is not uh, recording all the uh, all the personal uh, personal identifiable items before he's giving his consent? Is there any way for your software to disable some kind of logging before you, you have given consent on the website or you, do you trust the website uh, uh, presenter that he's doing his job and not log anything else? You are now unmuted. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, we always have to trust the operator to some extent. And it's also, this is an interesting design decision because we are, and especially when we started out, we often ran into situations where we say, okay, at some point, the user who has opted out or has not opted in yet, um, will need to make a request. So how do we make sure those requests do not, um, do, are not distinguishable from requests that users are doing that have opted in? Um, so there is some, I mean, you will have, uh, 
when you're opting out, you will have to make one request, but it's definitely possible for us to not leak any information about your status from this request. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. So um, I would uh, ask it. I would ask everybody to just go to open.dev or ask the uh, both of these uh, on Twitter or GitHub. Look, uh, look at the code, check out the code, um, cloning it, maybe make it even better, help them uh, make often a, a good piece of software. And I say thank you for your talk. Have a good and a wonderful day. Thanks for giving us your, your lecture and see you next time. Bye -bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye.